Uh, this panel uh, is entitled The Coloniality of Green Extractivism, um, and we have four papers here. Uh, the first one is kind of a theoretical paper, which will sort of set the tone for the debate, and then we will delve into three different case studies, which will take us all the way to Western Sahara, the Syrian Golan, and India. Uh, the first paper is entitled Decarbonization by Dispossession, Violence and Extractivism in the Case of Nickel. Uh, it will be presented by Diego Andreucci uh, from Erasmus University of Rotterdam and Gustavo Garcia Lopez, a colleague of mine here at the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra. And uh, the other co-authors are Marta Conde from the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, Cristo Zografos from Universitat Pompeu Fabra, Isabella Redhuber from the University of Vienna, and also Daniel McMillian from the Pompeo Fabra University and JD Farruccia from the same uh, university. Our second paper is entitled Wind Imaginaries, Renewable Energy and War in Western Sahara. And it will be presented by Joanna Allen from Northumbria University. Uh, this third uh, paper uh, is also about a similar, the same case study, uh, and uh, it is entitled New Masks, Old Colonialism, Wind Energy Projects in the Occupied Western Sahara and the Syrian Golan Heights. And uh, the Noura Al-Kahili uh, from London University, Muna Dana Dajani from London School of Economics, and Yahya Mahmoud from London University will be um, presenting their paper. And finally, uh, we have another uh, very uh, exciting case study. Uh, the paper uh, will be presented by David Singh from the University of East Anglia. And it is entitled, When Green Becomes Saffron, Caste, Class and Identity Conflicts in Borderland India, Wind Extraction Frontier. And so without further ado, I would uh, give the floor to Diego and Gustavo, uh, who will present this uh, first contribution. Ahead. Thank you. So the title of our presentation today is Decarbonization by Dispossession, Violence and the Coloniality of Extractivism in the Case of NICO. Uh, it is a collaborative paper, a collaborative research project that uh, Gustavo Garcia Lopez and myself uh, are working on, have been working on uh, together with several other colleagues, uh, both from academia and, and activism. activism. And, uh, uh, this is also part of a special issue that uh, some of us are co-editing. And um, at this point, I was supposed to give the word uh, I'm here. to Gustavo, which is here. Uh, please yeah. go ahead, Gustavo. Yeah, so uh, our special issue comes from the, well, first, uh, hi, everybody, and sorry for, for entering late. Uh, the last minute, my computer was restarting, so... I'm um, uh, very happy to be here with all of you. Uh, very good discussions in the morning. And so I think the, our contribution to in this special issue uh, comes from the observation as, as uh, already has been established in this conference that uh, there is a new wave of extractivism under the green veneer. And now this whole policy and discursive shift towards just transitions and green new deals with, which is both in the eco-socialist left and in the um, liberal Keynesian uh, uh, environmental environmentalisms. And so we see a contradiction and, and we wanted to explore more these political ecologies of the Green New Deals and Just Transitions and how uh, they may reproduce colonial extractivist patterns, but also what potential trans transformative potential they may have with alternative visions of Green New Deals emerging from grassroots movements. So this is what the special issue is. And it, it, these are the papers included, uh, uh, some of them already, uh, two of them already pub, uh, published, uh, the third one already accepted. Uh, our, uh, our paper led by Diego is, uh, is one of them. We also have two on the European Union from different positionalities, including uh, uh, Alexander's uh, Dunlap's uh, paper um, and others that you, that you will be able to see. We can share the link to the special issue in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Diego. Thank you, Thanks, Gustavo. Thank you. Um, so going back to our paper, um, our main aim, our main motivation was to try and address the socio-ecological challenges uh, of a just transition, particularly from the standpoint of extractivism. Now, we all know that uh, shifting away from fossil fuels is necessary and urgent, but we also know that the way that these 
transitions are being planned uh, is likely to be uh, socioecologically highly impactful and conflicted, uh, part, partly due to the expansion of renewable energy infrastructures, uh, but also to the unprecedented growth of mineral mining, which is required to sustain such infrastructure. And, and we claim that it's important to keep these two trends interrelated, to take, to take them together, what we call the energy extractivism nexus or complex. So our main claim, or one of our main claims, is that the way that they are being uh, designed and envisioned, dominant energy transition plans are likely to reinforce, uh, rather than challenge, the colonial character of extra, uh, fossil, the fossil, fossil energy regime. We see, we see these transitions as a response by fossil capital to intersecting crises of accumulation and legitimacy. And, uh, and from the point of view of capital, we think that renewables and green mining are being, uh, are being uh, understood as a fix, a socio-ecological fix to the extent that they uh, provide new outlets for investment and that they allow on a more um, sort of ideological level uh, capital itself, fossil capital itself, to present uh, itself as a climate savior rather than a climate villain, and at the same time depoliticize uh, the transition as a technical shift. Now, all this entails, of course, uh, very profound, very important uh, socio-ecological and geographical uh, reorderings. One of the most important ones is, is that a shift to industrial scale renewables uh, is profoundly changing the geography of energy, uh, particularly by include, increasing land occupation. Some critical geographers that are looking at this say that this is a history break, that we are on the brink of a history break in the, uh, say, geography of energy, uh, in the sense that we are shifting away, supposedly, uh, from the intensive verticality of fossil fuels to a more extensive spatial regime linked to, again, more land occupation. For instance, in the case of wind, we know that it can take up, up to 600 times more land uh, to produce the same energy that you would produce uh, uh, with coal. And it's even worse for biofuels. So this is likely to be linked to, a, to an unprecedented wave of enclosures, agrarian enclosures, with disproportionate impact on rural peripheries, indigenous territories, with some hotspot emerging uh, globally of conflict and so on. And it, it is also something that intersects with colonial uh, occupation as uh, I assume the other panelists uh, are, are going to uh, discuss later on. It's important to keep in mind, this is not just a shift from fossil fuels to renewables, but, but again, they are part of the same complex. Uh, so th these land enclosures that are going to result from more renewables are going to compound the impacts of fossil fuels, which will keep happening, and of mineral extraction, which is going to boom. So we look at this, uh, these contradictions by looking at the case of uh, nickel as a, as a representative of broader trends uh, that are also apply to other transition minerals. There has been in recent years among academic political ecologists and activists a uh, surge of interest in transition minerals, especially the most iconic ones like cobalt or lithium. Uh, but mm, we think it's important to also look at base metals that are less um, iconic, but, but equally important. For instance, in the case of nickel, uh, it is a metal that is fundamental for many, uh, for many uh, renewable energy technologies, particularly batteries and that as a result is expected to, to demand for nickel is expected to boom. Even if we take uh, the optimistic projections of capitalist institutions like the International Energy Agency, uh, we can expect a sharp ra uh, raise in demand. This is of course very problematic from a just transition perspective because nickel production is carbon intensive, destructive and concentrated in global trade rates. So to um, quickly, um, go uh, over the main findings of the article. Um, the first one is that this increase in nickel demand is causing an expansion of extractive frontiers and that this expansion is taking place primarily in the global south, specifically Southeast Asia. Today, Indonesia, the Philippines 
uh, account for over 40% of global production, and they were expected to increase their importance as producers. And other hotspots of conflicts uh, that we've observed are located around uh, nickel mega projects in other countries in formerly colonized or still colonized countries, such as uh, Colombia, Guatemala, or New Caledonia. The second finding, and this applies, of course, not just to nickel, but to, to metal mining in general, as I'm sure all of, all of you uh, that are here would know, uh, is that production uh, is associated with ecological destruction, dispossession, and violence. Uh, we have observed a wide array of socio-ecological impacts that are typical of all large-scale metal mining, uh, contamination, deforestation, enclosure, uh, water grabbing, and, and so on. And it's impo important to remind, or, um, to, to remember that these impacts are always dis disproportionately affecting uh, certain collectives, such as uh, racialized rural communities and women. Uh, we've observed indigenous rights violations in pretty much all the cases we looked at, and there are some really uh, terrible uh, uh, cases of um, indirect and direct violence against women, such as in the case of the Phoenix mine in Guatemala. And to sort of complete this rosy picture, uh, all of the countries where some of these mega projects are taking place are um, in the list of the top, but most deadliest, most deadly countries uh, for environmental defenders, according to uh, the annual reports that uh, Global Witness produces. And, and lastly, um, we've seen that the expansion of nickel production is accompanied by a sharp increase in energy use and emissions at the point of extraction. We know that nickel is remarkably carbon intensive as a mineral to produce. The World Bank considers it one of the most uh, um, um, associated with, with, with carbon emissions but with the highest global warming potential. And, this, uh, and these emissions increase as the quality of deposits diminish, right? So it's, it's only going to, in, to, to increase. So we see paradoxical uh, phenomenon like the one that uh, our comrades from Indonesia uh, presented this morning, whereby um, places where a lot of nickel production is going on uh, are seeing a strong increase also in the in in the in the um, in the generation of energy from 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 coal plants, fossil fuel fossil fuel plants, and associated to that also an increase in coal mines. So big paradox there, whereby in order to supposedly decarbonize the global economy, um, fossil fuel plants and and fossil fuel extraction is increasing. And of course, this is also associated with indirect impacts. Uh, that are caused by these uh, fossil fuel projects and the, and the sort of uh, offset projects that some companies are promoting to, uh, to uh, offset these emissions, like the palm oil plantations that are being promoted in Colombia uh, around the Cerro Matoso plant. Now, very briefly, just to recap our main argument, we think that an extractivist capitalist-led transition, the way that is currently being planned, uh, it's reinforcing neocolonial new colonial patterns of unequal, unequal exchange in the sense that it is intensifying ecological destruction and dispossession and displacing it to peripheries. Uh, it relies on the value in territories and populations, um, or our, as our colleague Christos Sografos puts it, it's creating green sacrifice zones. And again, related to that, it is not only shifting ecological destruction and dispossession to uh, peripheries, also decarbonizing imperial cores at the expense of uh, countries that produce the minerals or that manufacture uh, the renewable technologies, the batteries, and so on. So even though uh, overall renewables still have less emissions than fossil fuels, these emissions are being uh, increased are specifically located uh, in these extractive peripheries. So we, we are seeing something that we think is consistent with the idea of carbon colonialism. And to conclude, um, we, we think that decolonizing energy transitions can, cannot rely on policy fixes. Uh, they can help, but they're not enough. Uh, we don't trust corporate responsibility standards. Uh, we think that 
uh, ideas like decoupling and circularity as presented by capitalists are uh, fantasies and dangerous ones. And we think that instead we should focus on uh, the challenge of, of an energy transition, of a just energy transition in getting away from extractivism. And for us, getting away from extractivism doesn't mean just mining less, not just keeping the oil in the soil or whatever. It means getting out of the predatory logic of capital accumulation and colonialism. And to use the words of uh, Martina Arboleda, this entails a total struggle against capital. And the, the beginning of the struggle is already taking place in the uh, actually existing uh, struggles that are going on in several territories across the globe for energy sovereignty, territorial resource sovereignty, and other forms of uh, ways of uh, reappropriating sovereignty from us, so, from subaltern uh, populations. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Diego, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful presentation that I think really sets the tone for our next uh, case studies. And um, without further ado, I'll give the floor to Joanna Allen, if you want to test your sharing screen, uh, who is going to present us uh, with the case study on wind imaginaries in Western Sahara. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good. Can you see my screen? Also great. Oh, fantastic. That's great. great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sophia. And thank you for the introduction. Um, so um, I'm going to talk today about wind imaginaries, renewable energy infrastructure and war in Western Sahara. Um, so uh, forgive me, I'm going to give quite a lot of contextual information because um, the Western Sahara context is um, quite unknown. So apologies for people in the audience who, who already know a lot about this. Um, so Western Sahara, um, here's the official UN map of Western Sahara. Um, it's a desert territory uh, bordering Morocco and Mauritania, and it was a Spanish colony until 1975, at which point, rather than decolonize according to the UN process, Spain sold it off, really, to Morocco and Mauritania in exchange for continued access to Western Sahara's very rich fisheries um, and to a share of profits from the lucrative phosphates mine, um, which is still one of the world's first sources of phosphates today. So according to Morocco, Western Sahara formed part of the Moroccan Sultanate ahead of Spanish colonization in the 1880s. Um, but the International Court of Justice, in a legal opinion that it issued in 1975, disagreed and urged a self-determination referendum on independence for the Sahrawis, who are the indigenous people of Western Sahara. Um, but Morocco and Mauritania invaded anyway and used napalm against the fleeing Sahrawi refugees. Um, so that, at that point, dozens of thousands of Sahrawis fled to Tindouf in Algeria, which you can see in the in the corner of the map um, there in the western corner of Algeria. Um, and the Polisario Front, which was the Sahari nationalist movement formed um, during Spanish rule to fight for independence um, for the Saharawis declared a state in exile in those refugee camps in 1976 called the Saharawi Arab Democratic Republic. Um, Saharawis that didn't or couldn't flee in 1975 um, still remain under a Moroccan occupation. So um, you can see a red line bisecting the map there. That's the longest active military wall in the world. And it separates Saharawis living under Moroccan rule, um, rule in the western part of the country from a Polisario controlled liberated territory in the eastern part of the country. Um, so, so some Sahari nomads um, have lived there until recently, um, but it's heavily landmined. So that limits um, the possibilities for Polisario to move refugees back into the part of Western Sahara that they control. Um, and then about 180,000 Sahari refugees live in the camps in Tindouf. So Morocco and Polisario were at war until 1991. Um, when the UN brokered the ceasefire on the promise of self-determination, um, but that referendum has never happened. Um, in November 2020, war resumed between Morocco and Polisario, um, and I'd argue that 
resource exploitation, including um, exploitation of wind energy and solar energy, has played a, a part in triggering that return to war. Um, so Saharis have long made clear that the continued exploitation of Western Sahara's natural resources would result in an end to the ceasefire. Um, and on the long list of exploited resources, so I've already mentioned fisheries and phosphates, there's others too, um, but exploitation of renewable energy, I think, has constituted one of the greatest threats to Sahrawi independence. Um, and this is because energy isn't only booty to be sold off for profit, but it's inextricably tangled up in politics, in territorial expansion and violence, as, as we know. Um, so since 2009, um, Morocco has overseen a rapid development of renewable energy infrastructure in occupied Western Sahara. So there's a, a map here by Western Sahara Resource Watch, um, a, a Brussels-based NGO that I volunteer with. Um, and Morocco takes its, its colony um, as a source of electrical power, thereby strengthening its hold on Western Sahara by way of the irreversibility of physical infrastructure and also because of Morocco's energy dependence on or increasing dependence on, on Western Sahara. So the twisted metal strands of transmission lines connect one territory to the other. Um, the cables crisscrossing the border to, between Morocco and Western Sahara mirror Morocco's discourse of the territorial integrity, which imagines Western Sahara as an integral part of the Moroccan nation. And then beyond the Moroccan grid, grid, excuse me, links to the EU energy market by way of submarine connections to Western Sahara's former colonial power, Spain. So about a quarter of uh, Morocco's renewable energy comes from occupied Western Sahara. Um, and you can see on the map here, there's plenty more planned developments. So the yellow ones are planned and the red ones are up and running. Um, Morocco's main corporate partner, um, and the only foreign corporate partner to be involved in all the Moroccan government's wind developments in Western Sahara to date um, is the company Siemens. Um, actually now uh, Siemens Gamesa, which is a, um, a merger of Siemens and Gamesa and it's a Spanish headquartered company. But 67% of the company is owned by Siemens. So I'm just gonna refer to Siemens throughout the rest of my presentation for ease. Um, so Siemens builds these wind farms against the express wishes of the Polisario and Sahrawi civil society. There's some pictures here of protests and so on um, from, some, from Sahrawis. Um, Siemens has consulted no one but the Moroccan occupying government and representatives of Moroccan settler groups living in occupied Western Sahara. Um, so Siemens is this way furthering Morocco's colonial hold on Western Sahara via physical infrastructure, but it also does so discursively. Um, so my main contention in this paper is that imaginations, imaginaries, the meanings we attach to wind are inextricably tangled up with energy systems, that is energy infrastructure, energy policy and energy use. And this is how Siemens discursively reinforces um, Moroccan colonialism in Western Sahara. Um, so the imaginations of or the meanings attached to wind and the wind bloom have implications for the politics that uh, wind energy systems mediate. Um, so in this paper specifically, I want to have a look at um, Siemens colonial wind imaginaries. Um, so I've got a screenshot here. Um, of what was the Siemens in Morocco homepage. So since the Siemens Gamesa merger, things have changed a bit, but um, this is um, sort of what I was focusing on when I began this research project. Um, and I think it's a really interesting example um, because it was the homepage. So I want to look at the aesthetics of this image for a moment. Um, the aesthetics of desert and desert wind um, and how they're presented also in a, a video that was embedded in this page. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll go to that video first. Um, so I'm just going to play the first few seconds of this 
PR video on Siemens developments in Morocco. So worth pointing out that all its developments in Western Tara are described as being in Morocco, which is significant in itself. Um, but I just ask you to focus on the sound effects and the interplay of sound voiceover um, in the video um, in conjunction with the text as it appears on the screen. To draw the wind, you must tame it, understand its direction, its power and its energy. Drawing the wind... Okay, so really just a few seconds. Did you hear the sound there all right? Yes, it was good. That was good. Thanks very much. So, um, hopefully you would have heard the video opens with the desolate howling desert wind, that sound of wind that's so typical in, in Gothic films and period dramas. Um, and But then that uh, howling wind makes way for motivational music just at the moment that the text Siemens presents comes on screen as if representing that colonial encounter um, between the wild and the civilized. The imagery of sand blowing and relative emptiness um, and the camera angles used which point upwards from the bottom of the mill to make the mill seem sort of majestic, um, sorry, majestic and um, gigantic um, is meaningful, I think. Um, also, this idea of Siemens taming, as it says, and understanding the word, the wind, is important. Um, and if we look back at the uh, the screenshot from the homepage, um, we've got the camels there that are possibly suggesting that this wind farm effortly fits into the traditional life of Saharawis. They were camel pastoralists traditionally. Um, the irony of that is that the wind farm that you can see in the, in the picture there where these camels are, this was built on land grabbed from an elderly Sahrawi woman who was arrested when she complained about it and she now has nowhere to graze her animals. And I'm told that she wasn't alone. There were three other Sahrawi families whose land was stolen to make way for this development. Um, so what that, this tells me is that for seamen, Sahrawis are completely disposable. Um, because they have not made capitalist use of these waste sandy lands and these howling wild winds so they can be robbed from full stop. So Siemens borrows and patches its discourse from worn colonial stereotypes with recourse to the idea of terra nullius, no man's land, um, the West's technological acumen in overcoming climatological, mainly wind in this case, barriers, um, put up by the desert and the indigenous people's lack of initiative in finding a way to put the useless and hostile empty desert and its howling wild winds to useful work. Um, and the use of perspective um, by Siemens to emphasize the enormity of its wind installations, the white cylindrical curves suggesting futuristic technological prowess um, and sophistication in design. Um, is sorry, I'm sorry, you have two more minutes to conclude. Okay, thanks. That's further um, emphasized with its juxtaposition um, with this picture that shows flat rocky scrub and spiky sparse flora um, creating this idea of terra nullius. Of course, it's nothing new for a multinational to draw on colonial cliches to justify its dubious activities. But what's of interest to me here is the centrality of wind, Aeolian geomorphology, so landforms created by wind, such as sand dunes, um, and the colonial discourses in the case of, of Siemens. Um, so just finally, um, I want to link back to how this paper fits into wider research. Um, so as well as highlighting Siemens role in furthering colonialism through its colonizing wind imaginaries, um, I've worked with some Sahari colleagues um, on the wider energy regime in occupied Western Sahara and how it enacts oppression and violence. Um, so um, in the paper with Mahmoud Lamadal and Hamza Lakhal, we did an ethnography of the energy system in occupied Western Sahara. Um, and then on the other side of my research looks at Sahari wind imaginaries and how they might uh, inspire or are inspiring a different 
energy system. Um, so in, in the second paper there, I've been looking at Sahari wind imaginaries in Sahari poetry and how their wind imaginaries challenge these colonial wind imaginaries put forward by um, Siemens. And my hypothesis, so ending with a hypothesis for the wider project, I suppose, is that um, nomadic wind imaginaries, Sahari wind imaginaries, um, challenge and offer an alternative to uh, colonial energy transition. Wind imaginaries give us a way into a, a wider Sahari nomadic ideas that refute human exceptionalism in the desert ecology in which egalitarianism is key. So um, sorry, I don't have time to talk about that a bit more. Um, but yeah. thanks very much. That's I'll thank leave you it very there. much, and hopefully we'll have more time to uh, explore this in the Q and A uh, section afterwards. And now I will give the floor to Nura, Muna, and Yahia. I don't know uh, who of you will share the screen. Um, and hopefully, this uh, first paper by Joanna already sets the the scenario for uh, delving into yours, which is also. Uh, based on the same case study. And you have the floor, Muna, thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Yeah, yeah actually was going to start, but uh, can you see the screen? I'll be sharing the slides. Yes, I can. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. We hear yes. you both very well. Okay, thank you. Okay, I would uh, just start by saying that uh, Noura, Muna, and I, uh, we're very thankful to the organizers for giving us the chance to share with you this ongoing uh, 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 work and uh, hear your opinions uh, uh, on it. And uh, the preliminary title that we're giving to this is New Mask Old Colon Colonialism. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, uh, our starting point, um, Mune, can you go to the next? Yeah, okay. Uh, our starting point is like many um, of the starting points that I've been hearing this, uh, this morning. Uh, and that is the um, uh, struggle with this uh, globalizing, standardizing discourses and narratives that are used by some uh, uh, power centra to um, uh, execute specific strategies uh, responding to specific uh, 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 interests. And then, um, um, we try a little bit to, to go through some examples of those uh, narratives. And we say that uh, oftentimes those narratives, they use very, very powerful concepts that uh, with, the, with time they become naturalized and even sacred that nobody can go uh, 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 against. And one of them is uh, climate change mitigation, sustainable development, ecological modernization, and so on. And, 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 and so forth. Of course, these uh, uh, concepts had been treated, criticized, uh, put upside down by, by many uh, uh, social scientists um, for not being neutral, for representing specific interests. Uh, but uh, in this specific project, we tried a little bit to give examples where these narratives, they become a double or a triple uh, burden or in specific context. Um, and um, in the uh, cases of colonization or the cases like the two cases that were taken up here, uh, you could see that um, uh, these, they become a hinder and a burden to things that we've taken for granted already in the last century, like self-determination, like sovereignty, and things that are unfortunately not uh, high on the uh, agenda today. So this is what we try to do a little bit in this in this paper. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we look exclusively now on the on, on the case of how green extractivism in settler colonial settings uh, uh, becomes uh, that uh, uh, double burden. I think that uh, Johanna, in the very nice and uh, uh, interesting presentation, already touched upon some of these uh, uh, issues, but. Um, what we will try to do, or what, what we try, what we're doing in this paper, is showing details on how these um, uh, strategies that are backed by uh, 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 global interests uh, are leading and, and creating conditions 
that are making both uh, for the Sahrawis and the Julanis the, uh, the, uh, uh, are creating hinders to become closer to that uh, self-determination that they've been uh, fighting for for uh, uh, decades. Uh, and we're seeing very interesting moves on the name of this um, uh, uh, of these narratives. Uh, for example, the latest and the tragic thing that happened, at least in the specific case of, of Western Sahara, is the radical change of the, uh, uh, of the uh, political agenda in, in, in Spain in relation to how the issue should be, should be uh, 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 solved. And it is the same government, it's the same political actors that talk about self-determination elsewhere in such a warm and a nice way, and they do exactly the opposite thing. And uh, what we're trying to argue here, here is that without this concept that we as researchers, as scientists and all that are participating in their creation and in their uh, um, um, uh, use are having really uh, devastating effects on specific cases like, uh, uh, like this. Uh, Joanna already mentioned and we will be mentioning uh, 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 in our study some of these uh, big actors, both private and public, that they reinforce and give the occupiers the, the means to be able to cement their uh, 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 occupation challenging all that um, 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 uh, legal rhetoric that had been taking place uh, since the 1960s. Uh, uh, so hopefully uh, we will be able to come back to some of these issues uh, during the, the session of questions and, 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 and answers. And I just hand over to, to Muna so she goes a little bit more into the, into the, the specific cases. Great, thank you, Yahya. Thank you again uh, for the organizers for such a great conference and uh, looking forward to the Q&A. Um, so, uh, without also yeah, repeating as well what we have said before, but kind of really emphasizing a few important things about why we chose these two case studies and why we think they are very significant. Uh, when we think about you know combating climate change, this global uh, global threat to humanity, and wh what are the challenges and what what are the limitations of that globalizing as aspect of climate change policy making. So we speak about two cases, the occupied Western Sahara and the occupied Syrian Golan Heights, two cases that we have uh, based on literature and based on how people perceive, people who are living there perceive it as a cases of forgotten occupation. Why do we say that forgotten is because these cases uh, that have been for decades, uh, you know, these occupying powers, whether Morocco or Israel, in, that, in the case of the Syrian Golan Heights, they've been exploiting resources extensively, systematically, for multiple decades without any restraint, without uh, any accountability by the international community. Um, so people who live there, who experience that source of extractivist settler colonialism, uh, seem to see that the world has forgotten about them, that this is a case of forgotten occupation, that there are no repercussions for those two uh, occupying powers. But we see that, that these two cases are also exemplary of a resurfacing of, of these territories or these geographies as cases where it's an emancipatory, uh, um, you know, emancipatory solution to uh, pressing uh, challenges of climate change. So where, you know, the occupying powers uh, and um, you know, supported by the international community in, in those, both of these two cases, and also by, you know, multinational companies uh, and uh, green, um, like green uh, companies. Um, so they also reinforce uh, that this situation can go on, this status quo of dispossession of resources, first of all, second of all, denial of basic rights of self-determination, in addition to rights to resources, rights to sovereignty over natural resources, can continue unabated. So both cases for us uh, show this adoption of this green transition rhetoric and the commitment to reduce emissions uh, at, the at the expense of local communities and their aspirations. So Joanna really touched a bit on that. And uh, we, in our cases, are also really focusing on bringing about that aspect. What about the aspiration of liberation and self-determination uh, as supposed to be uh, um, um, withheld by the international community, supporting communities that are 
dispossessed? Uh, and why do, do we see them silent? How, why does the silence continue? And you know the, the very critical aspect of, it, of its continuing under a green guise uh, or a green transition guise. Uh, so both Sahrawis, Julanis have seen that uh, they have been experiencing those extractive renewable energy projects, namely wind energy projects, as, uh, as you know, a, a struggle for their existence on the land. So in, in a lot of you know, reports, in a lot of uh, demonstrations that have been happening against the wind uh, turbine project in both cases, we see the Jawlanis, Sahrawis uh, shaping and formulating their struggle as a struggle for existence. So it is the wind, tur wind turbine versus against their existence. So this is how significant those projects are. They're not only extracting resources, they're not only causing green colonialism, but they're also very, uh, very important and critical to people for their own livelihoods and their existence as communities with distinct uh, identity and distinct uh, as characteristics as, as one unit. So we see that uh, as well in those cases that both occupying powers are greenwashing uh, their extractive agenda. Israel has a long uh, as, has a long history of greenwashing uh, their actions using technological fixes and uh, building on this rhetoric of, uh, you know, technology saves the day uh, to, to further consolidate their control over territories. And we see that also in the Moroccan case in Western, in the occupied Western Sahara. Uh, so we also see what is really alarming is that we see that these, these um, um, resistance to these projects are named as attempts um, as attempt to kind of irrational attempts or detrimental to economic well-being of the community. So that is another thing that we will expand on in our paper. And then I move on to my colleague Nura for the uh, slice. Thank you, Muna and Yahya, and thank you everyone for this uh, amazing session. So um, building on that, we argue that um, Israel and Morocco consolidate territorial sovereignty and control and enforce an Israeli and Moroccan identity on both Jolanis and Sahrawi people and lands through these renewable energy projects. Ecological modernization narratives adopted by the two powers normalize realities of dispossession and embrace technological fixes to an inherently political struggle against its historical injustices and um, colonial legacies. So this rhetoric of nation state is quite strong in both cases and they present like it's a good project, it's, um, it's serving the people, as Muna said, um, it's for the development of the communities. And somehow they're trying to silence their long uh, decade struggles for achieving their self-determination by talking about environmental peace building agenda. Um, lastly, we would like to end, um, hopefully we could have a further discussion on the concept infrastructural colonization. Um, these two cases are undergoing colonization by green infra infrastructural development. However, we believe that there should be a sharp and a careful distinction um, has to be made uh, when we look at other um, situations, um, green neoliberalism being pursued in the European countryside, um, uh, what was coined by Dunlop in his um, extensive work as he referred to infrastructural colonization. Um, several communities in the West are fighting against neo the neoliberalization of the energy sector. And however, we believe that such a categorization is ignoring the systematic difference between the experiences, in our cases, Sahrawis and Julanis, resisting um, this uh, infrastructural colonization as a non civilian entities to those of Europeans living in a civilian nation states and whose experience, no matter how intrusive, um, we believe cannot be compared to communities seeking self-determination on their colonized lands. Um, such framing uh, is not taking into account that indigenous communities are struggling with this infrastructural colonization as an extension of the settler colonial project imposed on them, um, with its mere aim is the replacement of the indigenous people through this institutionalized project of elimination. So we hope we can further discuss this and uh, we look forward for further questions and, and uh, questions and discussions. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Nura, Yahya and Muna for this wonderful presentation and for keeping in time. Uh, amazing that you just showed uh, the perpetuality of colonial power structures in the, under the name of 
and the label green. And hopefully we'll have a very fruitful discussion around these terms of uh, colonial infrastructure and infrastructural colonization uh, with the ne our next panel as well. Uh, but before doing that, and before getting into the Q&A, uh, let me uh, give the floor to David Singh, uh, who is going to present our last case study based in India. David, the floor is yours. Yeah. Can you all uh, hear me? Yes, yes. very well. Perfect. And can you now see, see my screen? Also, it's good. <laughs> okay, I'll start right now. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, everyone. Um, I think we had three uh, fascinating presentation and it's really, really interesting that despite our uh, geographical context, I'm going to talk about India and you have spoken about, you have spoken about uh, Sahara and, and, and Syria. It's interesting how much I'm going to probably repeat some of what has been said. Uh, all this discussion that uh, Joanna has uh, led about wasteland, about emptiness, and about this colonial cliche are were highly and mostly present in my in my field work and and all this issue about infrastructure infrastructure infrastructural colonization sorry so i'm not going to try to repeat what has been said uh, i think i'm going to change a bit my presentation and i'll go directly at, at the second part of my presentation but uh today my presentation is about uh so i'm going to get directly to my field work i think to this image uh which is a, a partial villager from a village i call Haruma, which is a village situated uh, on the western side of, of India, right at the border with Pakistan. It's a village mostly populated uh, by Muslims, and because of that situation, since the partition with Pakistan and India, uh, the Muslim presence on the border between India and Pakistan has been generating a whole set of rumors, a set of whispers uh, about their loyalty, about being them untrustworthy to protect the border, and you know, this is in line with the, the, the Hindu nationalist uh, definition of citizenship, the uh, promotion of, a, of an ethno nationalist definition of space, of identity that has been, you know, imagined and constructing the Muslim in India as a minority. They are a minority, but they have been constructed as the, as the other, as the infiltrator. And in, in this part of the country, of the border area, it has been, uh, this construction has been justifying the recolonization of Muslim border areas with non-Muslim population, mostly Hindus and uh, uh, Sikhs, a process that we call saffronization of, of the border areas. And this has been done alongside increased surveillance of Muslim population via development projects like agriculture, uh, tourism, and more recently, windmills. That's where windmills comes. They're highly entangled with this project that started in the 2000s of opening up what was imagined as a, as a margin of the state, catch this district, sorry, this district where I've been doing my field work on the western part of India, has always imagined as a, as a margin of the state, as a, as a, as a wasteland, as a, as a dry land, and was for a long time considered by bureaucrats as a punishing, punishment post where you were sent there in the 60s and 70s. And after the 2001 earthquake that uh, hit that part of India, there has been a whole shift in turning the so-called vast dry lands and an attractive space for investors. And, and so the first special economic zone was entrusted here. And so windmills came uh, since 15 years ago there, uh, has thoughts following this liberal liberalization wave in India, but also highly entangled with what I think is the saffron wave is, is that dynamic of, of uh, you know, recolonizing and repopulating uh, Muslim borders area. And my research broadly has been about the land politics of wind extraction frontier uh, in, in that border uh, area. And how does it reconfigure resource governance and particularly how does it change or not? Uh, how does it strengthen or not? This borderland citizenship regime it has been highly marginalizing Muslims in, in India and has been reconstructing as, as the untrustworthy order. So I'm, I'm not going to go too much on that because these first elements that I wanted to present is about this wind extraction frontier and how it's built on construction of certain construction of wasteland of empty lands that is highly, highly you know colonial because it dates from the from the colonial era and the British have used a lot this construction to open up lands and and, and and turn them into agriculture and now these lands have been turned into industrial programs in the 90s and now they are turned into uh, energy production. But I just add a point that constructed certain land as waste also 
amounts to constructed certain lives uh, and livelihoods as wasted. And particularly here, the district that I'm talking about, Kach, is a pastoral district. People usually uh, uh, um, practice pastoral pastoralism, and you know, pastoralism has been constructed has since the colonial time has has primitive, has backward, has corrupted, and now even blamed for environmental degradation. But then you have this second dynamic of wind territorialization, where you have suddenly uh, hundreds and hundreds of trucks, of machines, of blades, of of windmills that arrive in the in the villages, that arrive in the space, and that suddenly you know, construct a new relation to space that impose new rules, new norms, new, new claims, and and the, the space appropriation of, of wind over there has been highly, I would say, unlimited, has been continuous and cumulative uh, process of land grab. But what is probably the more core of my presentation today is how this dynamic of wind expansion over space highly intersect with a dynamic of Hindu nationalism, with a dynamic of border infrastructure and surveillance through uh, wind development. I have to first state that companies, when they put their project on the ground, they need what they call the local strongman, these local muscle men. They need people on the ground, usually upper caste uh, landowning communities, to get things done, to get uh, the villagers accept the project, to buy the local piece, to manipulate resistance, to use muscle power, money power. And as they do that, as they clear land for companies, they also blend the windmills in the local landscape of identity politics, of ethno-nationalism and territory revival. So in the precise area where I've been putting windmills as they said it in the middle of Muslims, I think was not, from my point of view, was not an accident, it was not only following the map of wind resource. It was highly following this nationalist conception of a space. It was highly producing, and it is producing a, a new form of citizenship and boundaries and belongings. And it became evident to me as I did field work that uh, there was highly connection between the wind extraction frontier, it's, it's green extraction, it's green wave, and the saffron wave, which is the, 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 the project, the special project of recolonizing uh, so-called Muslim territories at the border. So what kind of forms did this uh, dynamic take uh, in my field work? I think the first dynamic was on the electoral uh, and the party politics uh, field. You have, so I don't know if you're a bit aware about the, the political landscape in India, but the far right party in India is the BGP, is highly present. Uh, it's uh, the, the Gujarat, the state where I've been doing my field work, is supposed to be the birth uh, uh, stronghold uh, state of Gujarat. But still, the border areas, because they are uh, operated mostly by Muslims over there, uh, they are, have not been, you know, gained and they have not been completely fully uh, integrated in that, that, that uh, dynamic. And so the, the BGP is trying to conquer and conquest this, uh, this uh, area. And he largely uses wind expansion to build on that. And so there was this two dynamic where uh, wind territory expansion of uh, new spaces around the border served the BGP in its electoral reconquest. And conversely, BGP success in, be, in converting new people, in expanding electorally, uh, offered new avenues for uh, wind territory expansions. And so I've observed this phenomenon where, uh, so Congress uh, politicians or the opposition party were joining the BGP for election and were thanked with uh, wind uh, um, uh, companies' uh, money financed by wind companies directly, important contracts in the wind sector, and they were always thanked with uh, this kind of hegemonic and privileged position of being companies' broker and, and fixers in their area of influence. But on the other side, uh, as people changed side and became uh, you know, BGP's new supporters, they also managed to then silence contesting voices, recruit new loyal brokers, among the BGP's uh, networks. And um, one of the main, um, I would say, character that was materializing uh, and embodying that, that, that uh, dynamic between BGP party politics and win was the local uh, member le legislative assembly, who, uh, when he was elected as a Congress uh, MP, I'm sorry, MLA, he was harshly opposing win, uh, win Mills on the basis of conservation uh, you know, projects and conservation uh, uh, issues and also the national bird, the question of bird species that were attacked. And then when he get votes uh, by the BGP, when he got money from the BGP to join him, he became one of the most prominent defend defender and supporter of the wind companies. But most prominently, I think that the wind complex doesn't only align in my field work with pure party politics, with uh, electoral fields. 
the wind assemblage there declares its affiliation to a nationalist project of territory revival. You know, that's what I've said. It, it supports and celebrates constant rituals of loyalty, of patriotism, of, of religiosity. And uh, what I saw is that has companies, brokers, a clear land for uh, companies and for windmills, they are in a certain mission to uh, reassert Hindu pride, reassert upper caste muscular uh, masculinity over what they imagine as being Muslim spaces. And so in that matter, I have uh, shared daily routines with supporters of the green and the saffron waves of so these wind contractors, these wind brokers, these wind representatives. I follow them from wind side to wind side, from villages to villages. And they try, as they interact with space, they try to build pure vegetarian upper caste and Hindu uh, space as they interact with space uh, in which they move. And so for small example, for example, at lunchtime, they will most, uh, uh, mostly avoid places that were serving meat or that were owned by Muslims and they will always prefer um, restaurants that were uh, owned by Hindus. As they interacted and as they moved between location, they will support you know, kind of um, um, affiliation to upper caste Hinduism. They will put uh, upper caste names on the wind company's uh, car. They will have Hindu flags uh, on the wind camp. So the wind assemblage became completely entangled with the upper caste uh, movement there and their muscular uh, power. And my final point is going to be about how wind infrastructures became in itself a border infrastructures and a tool of remote surveillance. I think that the speciality of, of, of um, wind infrastructures being spread around a uh, huge uh, space and time being no fences, no walls, is highly favorable and suitable for a renewed dynamics of control and surveillance. The village I spoke earlier at the beginning of my introduction, Haruma was first uh, in the 80s and still now visited by uh, military trucks, by uh, border security forces, by camp checkpoints. And all of a sudden, they were visited by uh, you know, wind blades, wind mills representative, uh, their trucks, their cranes, their companies. And for these representatives, they had a new access. It was opening up a new access to a space that they imagined both physically and discursively unreachable, that suddenly could allow to keep a suspicious eye you know, on this uh, pastoral uh, Muslim who moves between boundaries. And particularly in the areas where these, uh, where you don't have any fences, any borders, rigid borders, uh, windmills have become themselves a way to you know, materialize the border for both the outside and the inside. And all these ecosystems of CCTV cameras, cables, line, poles, and substations, and contractor camps, at some point mirrored the, the military complex and, and both and taken and, and blend uh, each other. So I think I'll stop my, uh, my presentation here and hope you have some interesting questions to discuss. Thanks.